Hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Martinus Center. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Eddie Solomon. Dr. Solomon is an instructor of chemical physics in the radiology department of Will Cornell Medicine. He received his PhD degree from the Department of Chemical Physics at the Weizmann Institute of Science under the supervision of Professor Lucio Friedman, where he developed novel MR method based on spatiotemporal encoding principles. In 2018, he joined the radiology department at NYU as a postdoc fellow, working closely with Professor Harish Gandra and Professor Tobias Bloch on the development of motion rebuff solution based on rapid non-Cartesian MR methods. Dr. Solomon is the owner of two US patents in the field of early detection of breast cancer, is an editorial member of Data in Brief, El Savier Journal, is a member of the NIH Quantitative Imaging Network Working Group, and received several summer cum laude and magna cum laude ISM awards. I would just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have using the Q&A box or raise your virtual hand. Dr. Solomon, thank you so much for coming here today. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you all for the for inviting me here and thanks for the kind introduction. So uh, my title of my talk for today is Exploiting Dynamics by Fast MR Imaging. So in this talk, I will cover some of the work I've done during my time at the Weizmann Institute, uh, which was mainly uh, focused on the developing methods in spatiotemporal encoding, and some of the work that I've done during my time at NYU, which was more towards developing motion robust solution of under non-Cartesian acquisitions. And you can see some of the examples here. So um, the outline, I will mention, I will give a brief on SPAN uh, in the context of diffusion MRI, uh, the work we have done in small animal imaging at high magnetic field, uh, human imaging in challenging body regions. <clears throat> in the second half of my talk, I will cover another non-Cartesian uh, acquisition method. This is the radial and spiral imaging. And I will present a new method for detection and correction of motion, which we call the piloton, uh, the development of an IR prepared T1 weighted radial brain imaging, and the use of accelerometer sensors for the detection of respiratory motion. And if I'll have time, I'll mention some work that we have done also in lung imaging. So uh, first I would like to list the main advantages of spatial temporal encoding, which we call SPAN. So the most significant benefit of SPAN lies in its robustness against P0 and homogeneity. So in this example, you can see how SPAN is less affected of uh, delta B0 effects uh, when shimming the, the field to 200 hertz line width. And that is in comparison to the EPI. Uh, the second feature of SPAN is, is its capability to implement a spin echo refocusing for each individual spin packet it excites. And, by that, it actually eliminates the T2 star effects along uh, the span axis. Another interesting uh, feature of span is its ability to, dis to distinguish between multiple chemical sites mixed in the same volume. So for example, here you can see from one single acquisition how we can resolve two signals from water and silicon. And lastly, another important advantage when using zoom is the ability to zoom uh, into images without uh, any folding artifacts. And this is due to the basis of this method, which is free of uh, Fourier transform. So next I would like just to give a brief example, uh, brief about the principles of span acquisition uh, through this 1D imaging example. So in the beginning, uh, spins are pointing in the direction of the B0 field and are stated in equilibrium. Uh, with SPAN, we use a frequency swell pulse, uh, which is also known as chirp pulses, uh, that has a frequency that actually varies linearly as a function of time. So in the end of the excitation, we end up with the quadratic phase, and you can see the term here on the top. Uh, additionally, at the same time, when we use those chirp pulses, we also have an encoding gradient that causes each spin in the sample to persist at a different frequency for a given bandwidth. So the, so the bandwidth here is a function of the gradient itself and the delta O is the bandwidth. So 
in principle, the stronger the encoding gradient here, the bigger is the bandwidth, and thus the higher the robustness to be zero and homogeneity. Uh, during excitation, once the chirp RF frequency matches the spin's resonance frequency inside our sample, it will start tilting single spin packets from one side of the sample to the other side. And it will do it from longitudinal to transverse, of course, and it will do it in different times. Uh, to acquire the signal, we apply a second decoding gradient. Uh, here is GA, and that will sequentially rephase all spins until each and every one of them will reach an echo. The final image is obtained by an absolute value over the signal, uh, meaning that we don't need to do any Fourier transform in that axis. And usually when we do a 2D imaging, the span axis would usually replace the phase encode axis. And while the other axis would be the conventional readout. Uh, now, since SPAN and EPI are both considered single shot methods, I want just to list the main comparable features between the two methods. So, and you can also see that the two schemes, they, they look similar to one another. Uh, so in EPI, the final image, as we know, is obtained by the 2D Fourier transform, as we can see here on the right top. And in SPAN, as we said, no Fourier transform is needed. And that usually would result in a broader point friend function that would require additional super resolution processing. Uh, in EPI, uh, while the gradients, the phase encode gradient determines our k-space resolution, in SPAN, the same gradient actually determines our excitation bandwidth. So it's a, a bit different. Uh, in EPI, all spins experience a constant echo time. But with SPAN, since we sequentially excite and acquire spins along our sample, so different spins will have different echo times. And um, with SPAN, we, the signal that we have is mostly under the effect of T2 and T2 star in the center of k-space. Uh, in SPAN, if the time of excitation is equal to the time of acquisition, then we can also achieve a T2 star refocus. And that means that every spin packet that gets excited will experience the same equal evolution time before and after the 180 inversion pulse. So uh, more in the context of diffusion, if one wants to use this method for diffusion. For, uh, so we'll start from the spin echo, the simple uh, example of spin echo, where we have a single excitation, where we excite all spins, uh, with a, say with a slice select pulse, and then we have additional diffusion block, the, the, the PGSC. And most importantly, all those gradients affect all spins uniformly. In spins, since we have a different sequential excitation, that would also lead to a different weighting. Uh, so that means that earlier spins to be excited, as you can see here, uh, will experience the maximum gradient weighting until they reach an echo, while later spins to be excited will experience minimum gradient weighting. And this is specifically for the scenario of using that pulse sequence. Um, now, in order to extract diffusion maps for spin echo, we usually take in consideration the PGSC effect, uh, the gradient, the imaging gradient, and the cross term effects. In SPAN, the use of the, diff the different gradient weighting stresses uh, a more special need to come up with a more exact p-value calculation that would, meet, that would need to be dependent on position. So, um, however, we can't, for the, we can't use the, sketch, the statual tenor uh, formalism for that because uh, that is a formalism that is more suitable for diffusion effects that are linear and independent of sp uh, spins positions. So for span imaging, we had to take a different approach that relates the diffusion effects with spin evolution. So this way, the attenuation function, as you see here at the bottom, uh, would be given by the local spatial derivatives of the phases as a function of position. Um, and that uh, small principle opened uh, the, the door to, to use uh, SPAN, uh, whether it's DTI or DWI, because now that we have the formalism, we can come up uh, numerically or analytically with the right terms uh, to do an accurate measurement. 
So here I want to present some of the work that we have done in small animal at high and ultra high magnetic fields. So uh, when we go for high magnetic fields, as we know, it raises challenges such as the B0 field and homogeneity and average performance, which many times leads to poor, poor anatomical images. On the other hand, uh, the high magnetic field increases the contrast in the SNR. So in the first uh, study, we performed uh, DTI measurements in red brain, which as we know, offers a way of measuring the motion of a water molecule in white matter tracts. And we applied here for SPAN, and you can see we are comparing ourselves to uh, the multi-shot, spin echo multi-shot, the EPI at the spin echo EPI at the bottom, and then SPAN. And here, uh, in order to enhance the spatial resolution, we uh, applied a segmented acquisition that simply we uh, divide our case space coverage into number of independent acquisition. And by that, uh, we are, um, we're um, increasing our spectral resolution. And also uh, we found out that we are, when we shorten our diffusion time and by that we increase the diffusion gradient amplitude, span DTI was also less affected by eddy currents. And you can see that here, the spin echo API, the color-coded FA maps were distorted just a bit. And that wouldn't be able, uh, we, were, we weren't able to avoid that unless uh, we're extending either the small delta or the big delta. And um, when operating at high magnetic fields, um, that and targeting these kinds of heterogeneous tissues, usually EPI suffers from inhomogeneities. And we know that, and uh, uh, to express the features that make SPAN here is of course the T2 star refocusing and uh, SPAN's excitation bandwidth that helps in overcoming tissue uh, heterogeneity for that uh, localized region that we uh, image. And of course also being able to zoom inside Along the, along the low bandwidth dimension. So in this study, you can see how these advantages from a single shot experiments, those are in vivo mouse brain. Uh, the span images show reduced in homogeneity, especially at the front of the brain. So uh, you can see it here in the map or in the magnitude images, while EPI suffers from inhomogeneities where every, everywhere that we have the tissue and air interfaces. The next example is a collaboration we had with Professor Luisa Siobano from Neurospin in France, where we uh, used uh, the 7T and 17.2 Tesla magnet fields. Um, and the aim here was to try to understand a bit more what would be if we would do the span imaging uh, under functional MRI settings. So what would be the neural activation uh, type that we would come out with? So we know that, the, that when we measure functional MRI, um, this is something that would be dependent uh, on the type of acquisition we would do, whether it's gradient echo API or spin echo API, but measuring functional MRI with span, particularly when we're focusing T2 star relaxation effect, can raise some question as to the signal origin of this method, especially since the T2 star relaxation here is the basis of the bold effect, as we know. So we performed two types of functional MRI experiments. Uh, those were uh, um, four pole simulation. Uh, when we did a typical um, non refocused span, that was very comparable to gradient echo API. And I don't show those results because that brought out the classical T2 star driven bold contrast. But in the absence of T2 star contribution, the fully refocused span showed increased number of active pixels when we moved when we made the TR shorter. That means when we went, as an example here, we went from three seconds to 1.5 seconds. And also experiments on a 7T showed that as the field decreases, and then the T, as we know, the T1 also gets shorter, then the functional, functional MRI contrast also decreases. So we have also dependency here on field. And usually at 7T, the T1 would be something around 1.5 seconds and a higher uh, ultra high field would be uh, 2.5 seconds. So our conclusions were that functional MRI span signal contain a strong component caused by T1 related effects. And um, uh, that was uh, a nice observation 
And we also show that the image quality when going for those uh, ultra high fields, the image quality of SPAN was uh, much better than SPIN echo API, where it was suffering from artifacts, as you can see here at the primary motor cortex, and also signal losses in the lower part of the brain. Um, another work that we have done in uh, small animals was um, that this project, and specifically when we do uh, imaging of abdomen in small animals, we always have the respiratory motion and, the, and we have uh, the tissue heterogeneity and a variety of blood velocities within a single voxel. So in this project, what we did, we performed fluid measurements in pregnant mice. And we wanted to understand better how these measurements can provide valuable insights regarding the structure and the function of the developing placentas. So a bit about the, the, the structure of the placenta. So mouse placenta contain two independent blood transport system, the fetal and the maternal with different size. And the fetal uh, blood um, is transported through a vascular system. You can see the scheme here on the right. Uh, the top scheme is the placenta itself and the lower part is the labyrinth. That is the, where the exchange between the, uh, the vascular um, system, which looks like a tree, tree shape, the, the, this is the fetal blood that's going through these, uh, these vascular system, and it is bathed inside the maternal pools. The maternal pools are those red um, um, uh, characteristics that are lined by trophoblast cells. So those blood pools are lined by trophoblast cells from the reason that those cells are in charge uh, of any exchange between the fetal and the maternal blood. And our aim was actually to try to separate the compartments. So in order to separate the compartment, uh, we did multiple diffusion measurements before and after administration of gadolinium BTPA. And two facts that, helps us, that helped us in doing so is the fact that higher, the high molecular weight of contrast agent uh, would usually enter the maternal circulation, but would not penetrate into the fetal circulation. And another observation that we did beforehand is that once the gadolinium TTPA internalized into the trophoblast cell, it creates a kind of a T2 style shortening effect. So the signal disappears completely with that compartment. So in view of these consideration, we performed uh, the following uh, uh, three experiments. Uh, those are diffusion experiments. The first one was at long TR before administration of the contrast agent. Uh, such that the signal we get is composed from all three compartments. So we have the maternal compartment, the fetal compartment, and the trophoblast cell. The second experiment is at long TR uh, after administration of the contrast. And the signal that we get from that experiment would be only the maternal and the fetal compartment uh, since uh, we get a darkening effect from uh, the cells, the trophoblast cells. And a third uh, experiment with short ER, that is again after uh, the administration of the contrast, where the signal we have is only the maternal. So that is the rapidly relaxing maternal component that is left. So uh, given the three equations with the three unknowns, we were able to reveal the diffusion and fractions of each of the three placenta compartments. And we also propose this uh, uh, flow model where we have a strong uh, flow inside the fetal capillary as expected and uh, lower diffusion in the trophoblast cells and almost free diffusion in the maternal blood pool. Um, now I will switch about the use of SPAN in human settings, in human scanners and breast imaging is a great example of a challenging uh, MR field that is mainly due to the heterogeneity that comes with the tissue. We have an abundance of fatty tissue. We have water and fat interference, uh, interfaces, sorry. And on top of that, we always have the breathing and the cardiac motion effects. So in clinic, um, in most cases, uh, the, the method of choice is the spin echo and to, to, to apply those rapid diffusion scans. 
but still APIs, Spineco APIs, prone to display several image artifacts that are known. For example, the folding artifacts along the phase encode axis. And you can see an example here, no matter in which direction we, we, we set the phase encode, uh, we still get uh, those artifacts. And uh, we have the chemical shift artifacts, uh, which means fat artifacts. And we have geometric distortion, which is not, it's just a, a less a realistic uh, observation of the tissue itself. So in one of our first breast studies, we proposed the following uh, multi-slice uh, pulse sequence based on a CHIRP 180 pulse which enabled us to zoom uh, onto both breasts without aliasing artifacts. So usually when you do spin echo API, you would need to set the field of view to cover all uh, the, the breast and the chest and until the back to avoid any uh, folding artifacts. Uh, but here we save a bit more time, echo time, when zooming along the phase and code direction, that is the span direction and uh, getting more uh, signal from that and also uh, in enhancing our immunity to chemical shift offset. So uh, on the left side, you can see a representative case of a complex breast cancer. This is invasive ductal carcinoma, and it has multiple cysts, and usually cysts uh, are characterized by high intensity, which tends to uh, fold from one side to another. And this is exactly what you see here on the left uh, at SpinEco when we use the SpinEco API. The, the high test uh, cyst just fall to the other side. And when we go to see the ADC maps, the ADC maps uh, have severe artifacts in the SpinEco API, while with SPAN, we have a very clean um, um, diffusion maps. Um, an advantage of using SPAN, particularly when it's considering its use for, say, evaluation of a lesion, um, we have the ability uh, to zoom on a single breast image in all three anatomical planes. And you can see that here, uh, we have an axial coronal sagittal with T2 way to turbospin echo. And then we layer on top of it, the ADC maps uh, that we get from SPAN. And that is in accordance with the subtractor diffusion contrast enhanced uh, imaging that we do. And uh, in so in SPIN echo API, you wouldn't be able to get a clear diffusion maps because I, you would get some folding from the other side of the breast or the, the heart would overlap on top of the breast. Um, and in this example, what we see, uh, we have a high ADC within the center of the malignancy and, and a nice rim enhancement surrounding the malignancy, which is characterized by low ADC maps, ADC values. Uh, in another resident work, we proposed a more advanced span pulse sequence. This time we used a multiband pulse along the span axis. So usually when people use multiband pulses, they use it along the size select axis. Here we used it in plane along the phase encode. So that would allow us to image both breasts simultaneously and resolving them by parallel imaging. And that would obviously lead to shorter echo time and higher SNR. Um, in this figure, you can see uh, the lesion, which is enhanced by the contrast. And then we compare ourselves to the diffusion maps provided by SpinEco API. And then we can also play around with how strong do we apply, how, how strong is the bandwidth that we uh, um, acquire together with the span. So keeping in mind that the larger the bandwidth, the higher the immunity to be zero field and homogeneity. And that would actually reveal a more precise anatomical definitions. And you can see that from comparing between D here, the bottom left to the middle, where we have low bandwidth compared to high bandwidth. So we get just slightly more precise anat anatomical description of the tissue. Uh, in F, what we did, we just combined both. We did a high bandwidth together with uh, a multiband uh, excitation where we uh, get to a sub-millimeter resolution. That was an interleaved acquisition. And when we do those interleaved acquisition, as opposed to Spinaco API or any other Cartesian, where when you understand case space, you would always have, you would straight ahead get the folding artifacts. Here, because we sample in space, so we avoid that. We don't have, each interleaved acquisition would not have those uh, uh, folding artifacts. 
So it would be more easy to compose the, the final uh, high resolution image. And that is just here on the uh, right bottom, you can see just another, another example of a 1.5 centimeter lesion size and, uh, and uh, a sub millimeter resolution uh, by span. More recently, uh, an alternative method to span was introduced, uh, which is called cross-term span, X-span, uh, which is not uh, which is not only able to introduce to refocus T2 star effects as I showed until now with span, but it also can overcome more efficiently the delta B0 effects. So in this example, X-span is shown in the right column and compared to span and then to spin echo API and then to the spin echo multi-scan. And what we did, we just simply degraded the, the shim of the field and we saw, and that started uh, from 30 Hertz to 3000 Hertz. And you can see how each uh, pulse sequence cope with this degradation. And um, you can see how x performs very well, even with such a non shim uh, field. So x deals with local field homogeneities by introducing a gradient broadening, uh, rather than trying to overcome any homogeneities in the tissue. And by, by uh, gradient broadening here, what I mean is using a linear background gradient that is along the Z axis. We can see that here, uh, which adds a source of light broadening to whatever field or shift distortion that exists in our, in, in our sample. So it also uses uh, dual frequency swap pulses acting simultaneously with their own bipolar gradient which can encode and decode the spins and deliver this uh, image free of distortion. And more in the context of diffusion, if one would like to use this pulse sequence um, in conventional diffusion API, uh, when we do uh, say uh, 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 diffusion measurements, the relatively weak B weighting effects of the imaging gradients in API can permit us to explore any diffusion direction that we uh, wish. This is shown here at the top right. But um, in SPAN, the strong background gradient that I just described that is in the basis of this method introduces a heavy diffusion weighting, which biases the range of the B elements and directions that we can sample. So we had to come with a solution for that. And to avoid that, we proposed a new diffusion gradient scheme, which results in a double cone shape. By that, we avoided uh, our dependency on the slice select axis, just uh, and avoiding it and doing two separate independent acquisition on the other two axes. And this double cone uh, shape uh, led to a more reliable measure of the diffusion parameter. So um, this approach um, is very um, elementary when doing human scanning. But if one would want to use that method for preclinical settings where we get the much higher gradient amplitude capacity, so we will so the, the, the regular scheme of gradients uh, being able to measure in all direction would not be a problem. It's just that the human scanner is more limited with its gradient uh, possibilities. So uh, here we compared the performance uh, of the diffusion experiments given by SpinEcho API and XPen on a four millimeter isotropic resolution along the axial, coronal, and sagittal. And the imaging advantages of XPen over a SpinEcho API here, and I want to draw your attention, is mainly a, a better shape of the eyes, for example, the nose and nasal cavity regions here at B. Uh, the cerebellum, you can compare the cerebellum compared to um, spin echo API, and also the brainstem here it is. Um, the figure on the right uh, is in just in the, just another additional example where we collected a three millimeter isotropic resolution where we zoomed in uh, on the front uh, of the brain and measured the diffusivity with DTI uh, of the optical nerves. So next I would like to switch gears and focus on another non-conventional acquisition. That is the work I've been doing, uh, I've been done in 
doing in NYU. And those acquisition methods are known as radial sampling. So why do we need radial case-based sampling? So we all love MRI and it's a powerful imaging modality, but it's slow and it makes it sensitive to motion. So, and to prevent respiratory artifacts in clinical routines, uh, most conventional MRI sequences acquire their data during a breath load, which can be a very limiting factor for, for different patients such as elderly or, or pediatric. And uh, many motion compensation techniques offer to correct motion artifacts, but their performance depend on a reliable respiratory motion signal. So those signals can be detected, for example, by external sensors, such as cushions or belts. However, we know that these devices tend to be sensitive to the patient position. Another approach would be the navigator techniques uh, that use dedicated RF pulses or gradient events inside the pulse sequence, but that also requires some adjustments of the sequence itself and uh, extra skill. Another alternative are the self-navigator techniques, the radial and spiral sampling. So these techniques are known to be more robust to motion artifacts than Cartesian sampling. And their data can also be used to extract motion information directly from case-based center. However, when using those self-navigated approach, uh, we can be limited a bit by the imaging scanning parameters. And uh, specifically, there's more sensitivity to motion along the slice volume where we extract the motion uh, information from there. So exactly for this purpose, we tested an alternative approach for estimating motion information uh, using a radio frequency signal called piloton. Uh, the piloton is a small RF transmitter. It's placed outside the MR ball with no direct contact with the patient. Uh, once it's placed near the subject, the physiological movement of the subject causes coiloid variation that results in modulation of the piloton signal, its RF signal, which then is picked by the receive call. So we are recording uh, the, 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 the emitted RF signal from the piloton from the MR calls. And uh, to avoid any interference between the piloton, it is tuned away from Larmor frequency, something around uh, at 3T, uh, around 100 kilohertz. To see the separate signals, uh, we need to do a Fourier transform, as you can see here, and then we can extract out the piloton over time and the imaged object. Um, the respiratory motion signal can be extracted uh, through a piloton detection algorithm that we developed that first calculates the frequency of the piloton, the exact frequency as emitted from the, uh, the, coil, the coils, and then uses this frequency to calculate the respiratory signal over time, as we can see, for example, here in the green curve. And in this work, the piloton was tested in combination with the radial stack of star 3D gradient echo sequence with golden angle acquisition. And we'll see more than that. The workflow using the piloton is the following. So during experiment, uh, you, one can put the wireless piloton transmitter away from the patient just a side to the MR ball, for example, or on the wall. Uh, the signal modulation is detected and extracted by the piloton algorithm and then removed from the raw data. And afterwards, the respiratory signals are smoothed and processed by PC analysis, which just helps us to separate the dominant motion signal from all coils. And the last step, we use a motion result reconstruction technique known as XD grasp where the data can be binned to different motion states, for example, from inhale to exhale. Um, to evaluate the piloton accuracy in real time, we explored a new acquisition approach where the golden angle, golden angle acquisition can be replaced by zero angle acquisition strategy. So to demonstrate this principle, uh, what I'm showing you here at the bottom is acquisition uh, of a sparse number of rotating angles. In this case, we skipped every third golden angle and that actually results in a pseudo 180 uh, degree angle view of the breathing subject. Now, when acquiring this, the, the, the data with zero angle views, as we can see here and on the right, uh, on the left top uh, figure, we get a static view of the subject while it's breathing. And this is along with the piloton signal that can be recorded in the green curve. 
uh, zero acquisitions were compared to the K-space uh, center signal uh, and the piloton uh, that is in green. And another way of extracting out motion information is from uh, the image space itself uh, through center of mass analysis. And we tested it through uh, different scenarios uh, during a breath hold, as you can see here in the white arrows, or during unsteady breathing. Oops. You can see it here. So this unsteady breathing, um, um, as you can see, all of a sudden showed us the piloton can be can gain a higher sensitivity even to small motion fluctuations uh, that the patient experiences when he's flying in the magnet. So uh, that is a 3D view of a healthy volunteer. Um, as an example, on the left side, the left column, you can see the average motion where no data is binned. Um, and we compare it to the XD reconstruction, been to 10 respiratory motion states from end inspiration to end expiration. And we did that once based on the case space center signal and once based on the pilot. And um, you could see, if you look closely following the yellow arrows, you can see that we can achieve clearer and sharper anatomical details, specifically at the liver dome and liver tip when using the pilot. Now we can also register uh, all 10 respiratory states to one motion state as we did here on the right. And as expected, the anatomical details are visible, but uh, with minor blurring as a, as a result of the registration. Now in this video, you can see the dynamic motion of this data set through all 10 motion uh, states. Uh, and, I, and here is the place to make the differentiation between the self-navigated approach and the pilotons that when using K-space center signal, uh, we only provide motion signal only once every projection angle as given by the pulse sequence. While with piloton, it provides information for each TR. So this extra information as an impact can have an impact on the quality of the motion resolved images. Some of the possible future applications when using piloton, um, piloton can also be used with other magnetic field strength uh, other than 3T. So here we tested it on a 0.55 Tesla clinical magnet. Uh, data was reconstructed again with XD, reconstru X, XD grass uh, reconstruction, being this time to six motion states. Um, another possibility is to demonstrate the use of piloton with other types of pulse sequences. So here we scanned a healthy volunteer where we scanned it with Cartesian gradient echo sequence. Now the use of piloton, and we can also get the, 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 the motion information from here. So the possibility of using piloton with Cartesian sampling can open an interesting possibilities especially for applications that are more known to be susceptible to motion. And I mean for diffusion experiment, for example. Another project I, I would like to mention uses the advantage of radial sampling for human brain imaging. So we all familiar with MPRH, which is a clinical standard scan for brain imaging, and it has an excellent T1 weighted signal contrast. Um, however, we know that when for example, non-accelerated MPRH sequence, uh, say with one millimeter isotropic resolution can take some time up to even 10 minutes. And that could be a problematic issue with uh, different patients. Additionally, uh, MPRH is a Cartesian based method and it has shown some uh, artifacts, uh, especially along the phasing code axis. And you can see an example here on the left uh, side uh, the same, um, the same uh, patient was scanned once with motion and once without motion. And this is a typical uh, phasing code uh, folding artifacts. So for this uh, purpose, we developed a radial based uh, T1 weighted pulse sequence, which we call MP-RAVE, uh, based on radial stack of stars 3D gradient echo. And we compared ourselves to MP-RAGE. So <clears throat> MP-RAGE, and you can see here the scheme, 
the, the pulse sequence scheme um, includes an inversion recovery pulse uh, that is played out once every stack of radial views with the same angle. Uh, and on the right, you can see the comparison uh, between MP Rage and MP Rave. Now, uh, the scan time of MP Rage um, with twice graph acceleration can come down to four minutes. And because MP Rave does not explicitly use as parallel imaging on the scanner, it can result in longer scan time. So uh, one way to explore this direction and to leverage the golden angle position for this purpose, uh, we uh, uh, check the option of reconstructing the data uh, on a limited number of radial views, what we call undersampled data. And by that, uh, providing more sufficient image quality, but also reducing scan time. So to exemplify this point, um, on the left, we have fully sampled uh, brain image, acquired with radial sampling, but if we choose to uh, go down to 32% or 16% of the number of spokes, we still produce good images, but below that, the undersampling streak artifacts can corrupt the images. So we tested the same approach uh, for a healthy volunteer with our MP Rave, and, um, and image quality and contrast showed acceptable results, even uh, down to 50% undersampling. And you can see it here. Uh, now we can take that even one step further uh, and improve uh, uh, the data reconstruction just by using iterative reconstruction instead of gridding. And you can see that at the bottom, um, we can see how this allow even reasonable image quality even down to one fourth of the data. Um, Leveraging the possibilities of the immunity of this kind of pulse sequence. Um, so in this example, we scanned the same subject with and without motion. So typically, as we said, with MP rage, you would get the folding artifact, uh, typical motion artifacts for radial sampling like, like MP rave would be blurring of, blurring of the brain details. So uh, one approach to try and resolve those blurring artifacts even further is by trying to track motion in time. And we can do that by taking advantage of the geometry of the radial trajectory, where it is possible to reconstruct highly undersampled navigator images in time. And by doing that, by doing that we can track motion between those navigators, correct for it, and then reconstruct again the high resolution data. So I'm showing you here a very high undersampled uh, data and how we can uh, track the motion between those uh, uh, subvolumes. Following this principle, we generated a retrospective motion correction pipeline. Uh, using the grasp reconstruction, we transformed the uncorrected data shown here on the left into multiple navigator images each reconstructed for, from a minimal number of radial views, and each navigator subvolume would be registered to a reference volume. Uh, and then the, according, from those uh, motion measures that we would get from the transformation matrix, the case per trajectory can be corrected for translation and rotation. And as a last step, we can reconstruct the fully sampled corrected volume uh, you can see it here on the top right. And in the bottom, we can see an example of the MP Rave motion correction scheme uh, for data that was acquired during severe head motion. And you can see here the, the translation and rotation measures that uh, we uh, detected. Another approach for sensing motion is, uh, is the small work that we did and was presented in the last ISMRM. Uh, where uh, we proposed uh, another way using um, low cost MR compatible accelerometer sensors. And in this slide, this slide you can see the setup of those uh, accelerometers. Um, accelerometers are placed on top of the abdomen and are uh, transporting the signal through wired shield cables to the control room. We can place those accelerometers on the chest or the abdomen. Um, uh, we used the commercial accelerometer sensors 
together uh, with the Raspberry Pi computer control um, the sampling rate of those sensors uh, as we experience those can go down to 50 milliseconds and they can cope more than one sensor and we has we have also an RF detector uh, system that um, which is in charge and synchronizing the sensors with the MR acquisition so triggering it kind of triggering an on state whenever the RF pulse is detected. So it's all sync with the MRI. Um, as the last uh, um, interesting project uh, that was also uh, presented in the ICMRM is our um, small experience with uh, spiral imaging. Um, um, sorry, this. So here, um, in this work, we we done uh, a UTE, uh, ultra short echo time technique based on stack of spiral trajectory. And uh, we applied the same methods we know how to, uh, to work with uh, during the reconstruction where spiral arms were grouped into different respiratory states uh, using uh, XD reconstruction. And uh, that is from the self-navigated signal we get from center of K-space. And the motivation for this work was uh, obviously trying to uh, come up with an alternative to the CT, which is the gold standard for the lung imaging and just saving the radiation there. And uh, the results that we got here um, from those three representative lung anatomical slices, um, I forgot to mention, but we also um, uh, do use a grog reconstruction, which is another way of um, mapping the non-Cartesian case-based data onto the Cartesian grid just faster. And we also use, of course, the gradient uh, conjugate uh, compress sensing approach that helps in uh, reducing the motion artifacts. And here you can see those uh, results uh, using the grog uh, XD grasp here on the left with the binning, and we just compare ourselves to the results we get from the scanner. That is the grading um, information, and we get um, nice and sharper lung renchemia structures using this method. Uh, so just to summarize, um, span imaging uh, can be an alternative uh, to single shot EPI, particularly at challenging uh, body regions. Additionally, sorry, uh, additionally, Piloton, with its small dimension, the high sampling rate, and the minimal interface that it has with the MRI can really have uh, to offer a great uh, way of resolving the respiratory motion. Uh, we also propose the novel radial sampling named MP-RAVE for brain imaging, uh, the use of MR-compatible accelerometers for reliable uh, tracking of respiratory motion, and also um, we proposed a motion corrected approach for lung imaging based on spiral UTE. So with that, I want to thank you and thank all of my colleagues who contributed to this work. And thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Solomon, for this great talk. And we now move to the Q&A phase. And I'd just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have either using the Q&A box, the chat, or just raise your virtual hand. And we have the first question coming from uh, Michel Spioni. Uh, is a Golden Angel acquisition scheme always necessary for those motion corrected approaches like the one using pilot room? Uh, it's definitely an advantage here because that's uh, once you have a very, and it, nothing to do with the pilot room, it's every, any, uh, motion signal that you would acquire, the the golden angle uh, scheme gives you the possibility to actually blend the 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 order of each and every one of those uh, spokes and to set them in the right way that in groups where each group would uh, represent a different motion state. So yeah, it's elementary. Great, thanks a lot. And another question regarding SPAN. Uh, you've uh, demonstrated application for uh, the chemical shift in the breast and, uh, and diffusion. Are there any uh, works related to spectroscopy or uh, magnetization transfer being done or planned on that regime, employing the, the immunity against B0? Uh, 
So uh, the principles of SPAN was actually uh, came from 2D ultra fast NMR. That is the work that uh, Professor Lucio Friedman has done during his time. And then uh, he just leveraged the, 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 the qualities of using those frequency swap pulses into the imaging field. So definitely, um, and, that, and he used those specifically, maybe just to mention that to accelerate the T1 dimension there, uh, instead of making the whole 2D NMR much, much faster from hours to a few seconds. Uh, in terms of motion transfer, I'm not uh, familiar with any work in this uh, context. So, um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I think we'll, we can conclude with, the, with that. And thank you once more again for this great talk. And we hope to see you next time in person. <laughs>